Hey everybody, this is Aubrey Chavez from Faith Matters. Today's episode is a tough one, to be honest. In the aftermath of a speech that Elder Jeffrey R. Holland gave recently to faculty and administration at BYU, we try to explore and understand why the message created such a firestorm. Among other things, the speech raised anew the church's long-standing challenge in dealing with LGBTQ issues. Don't worry if you aren't familiar with the speech. We give a little more context once the discussion starts, and the full transcript and video of the speech are available on the church newsroom website. Most of the work that we do in this podcast and at Faith Matters generally is to provide a forum where difficult issues can be honestly explored in expansive ways through real dialogue and understanding and in a spirit of generosity. And that can be really tricky to do on topics that seem particularly polarizing and raw. And we definitely don't always do this perfectly and we're sure we didn't in this episode. So we really appreciate the grace that we hope that you extend as we navigate this territory. As conversation partners, we brought on Patrick Mason and Tom Christofferson, both of whom have been close friends and advisors to Faith Matters for a long time. We felt like their perspectives would really help to round out both the theological and the personal aspects of this issue, and we weren't disappointed. We found their insights both realistic and reassuring, and as always, they modeled a gospel and a church that we're proud to be a part of. Thanks so much for listening. We'll jump right into the conversation. Hey, Tom and Patrick, thank you so much for doing this with us. And I, I really do mean that this is a heavier conversation and we really have a lot of respect and appreciation for the fact that you would show up and, and be willing to be in the arena and, and help us navigate this, um, this big topic. So, and, and you both are such expansive thinkers and you've done so much work loving and healing and ministering to the marginalized and, are, and it just feels like that's such an important um, all of those things feel so important for this moment right now. So we really, really appreciate that you are willing to come talk about this. Um, Thanks, so, and it's always good to see you. It's so fun to see you guys. So um, I'm going to give a little bit of context for anyone who doesn't know about Elder Holland's talk. And I'll try to just be really brief, but just in case you haven't been on social media at all or missed the whole thing. Um, so on August 23rd, so just a couple of weeks ago, Elder Holland went to BYU and he gives this speech to BYU faculty, staff, and administ- administration. Um, and he spends the whole, you know, first like half of the talk just expressing so much love for the university. And he reminisces about his love for the university as a kid and then as the president and, and his own experience at BYU. And, um, and then about halfway through, and he, and he really, he talks about BYU's unique mission and um, how it really should, should be a a peculiar university in the best way. It should really stand out and be different and, and that that is BYU's unique mission. And, and then about halfway through, he sort of shift, shifts gears and he starts addressing LGBTQ issues and specifically the way that he is um, concerned about faculty not defending the faith the way he'd like to see or, or its doctrine and policies on, on marriage and family. And, and so this is really um, the part of the talk that that has been troubling for a lot of people in our community over the last couple of weeks. And so Tim and I are going to try and, and ask you the hard questions, ask you the questions that we're seeing um, being asked and hope that our listeners will extend a lot of grace because this is just a, this is a charged topic. And um, I know it's one of those things that you can easily be, you can, you can get pushed back no matter what you say. And so, um, so we'll do our best to, to ask the questions that people are asking and, um, and just appreciate all of your, your, your thoughts about this. So maybe to start, um, would you, could you both just talk about maybe if, if there was anything in the talk that you, that actually did resonate with you, because there were a lot of, I mean, he expresses so much love for the LGBTQ community and so much love that it really does feel, it, it really did feel genuine to me, his love for BYU and for, and for the marginalized popula- populations. So, so I don't want to, I don't want to jump right to the things that were problematic and, and maybe we can just spend a minute and, and would you talk about anything that resonated with you or that you really did um, appreciate about, uh, about his speech? Do you want, um, Patrick, do you want to go first? Sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, I agree with you, Aubrey. I mean, there was a lot in the speech to, to, to love and it was characteristically Elder Holland, right? Yeah. With just this uh, profuse outpouring of, of love and admiration uh, for, for BYU and for all the good work that, that goes on there. And, and I absolutely share all of that. Uh, BYU is my alma mater. I've got two brothers who teach there. I've got a ton of friends uh, uh, who, who teach there. It was so important in my formation uh, uh, as, a, as a college student in terms of, of uh, taking on big ideas. You know, some of like the biggest thoughts I've ever, I had ever thought up to that point, you know, happened in BYU classrooms, but also in in the context where 
um, if even even if faith wasn't being talked about explicitly, it was always in the room, right? And and a lot, a lot of times it was explicit in terms of connecting secular knowledge with spiritual knowledge, and it was just it was invigorating. I mean, I, I just had a, a great experience there, and it, in a lot of ways, it set me up, you know, for for you know the the next quarter century, and and so I look back on that with real fondness, and 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 I think BYU absolutely plays a crucial role, both in American higher education. You know, I, I think there's this little group of of serious religious schools that are also serious about research and teaching. Right, you know Baylor and Notre Dame, my other alma mater, uh, and and Wheaton and and Pepperdine, and you know and 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 a handful of these schools, and BYU is right there, and it's such an important place in higher education that has become increasingly secular in recent decades, for BYU and these other schools to say no, we are a place that takes spiritual knowledge seriously, and you can integrate these two. That's that's the challenge, but it is a challenge. It's really right. tough to do. And, and I think what Elder Holland was trying to do is, is to get the faculty and staff and administration to, to kind of rise to the challenge. Not that they haven't, right? Not that this was news, right? Uh, but, but reiterating just how distinctive the mission is. And, and I love that part of it. I, I love that challenge. I don't know if we have all the answers. There are some real tensions there in terms of how to do the balance, right? Um, and, uh, but, but, but I think we absolutely have to, both to serve higher education, but most importantly, BYU exists to serve the church. And the, the church has gotten so much good out of BYU, not only out of its graduates and the way that's sent them out, you know, and had successful careers, but every successful and mature religion needs a place where the thinking gets done, right? And BYU is one of the places where, not the only place, but it's one of the important places where the thinking gets done for the church. And so, so I, I share Elder Holland's just love for the place and, 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 and care for its distinctive identity and mission. Yeah, love you know, that I think thing, Patrick. The, uh, what you're talking about there, Patrick, that balance. I, I loved at one point when he was reading what I believe was from a, a current professor at the university, but uh, his thoughts about the experience. And he, he in that letter, is talking about uh, emeritus professor John Tanner, who's had such an impact on the university and community. And he said um, he, John Tanner, knew scores of passages from Milton and other poets by heart, yet verses of scripture flowed, if anything, even more freely from the abundance of his consecrated heart. And I, I thought that was such a beautiful way to kind of see what he's trying to talk about, about that balancing of the mission of BYU in the life of a professor who has had such impact on so many people. I also, and Aubrey, you, you refer to this, <clears throat> I felt like the, in the whole speech, his emotions were very close to the surface mm -hmm. about his love for BYU. And then as he also uh, talked about that, um, you know, that he and many of the brethren have spent more time and shed more tears on the subject of LGBTQ members that he could adequately, adequately convey. And they spent hours discussing doctrine on the subject. And that, as he said that, uh, it brought tears to my eyes and certainly made me think about my experiences uh, in, during the time that I was a member of the ward in Salt Lake City um, that uh, Elder and Sister Holland were members of and the opportunities there to be a recipient of their many kindnesses and, and compassion and the goodness uh, that they represent in their outreach to everyone, um, not just the church as a whole in general conference, but really to individuals and in, in their own ministry, personal ministry, that we felt so profoundly as members of the same ward. Uh, their their kindness is there, and I and it reminds me that you, Elder Holland, in my lifetime has been um, one who's had such a gift for identity. Um, bringing into focus the often unseen, unheard members of the church so that the whole church can be more attuned to different experiences and, and that the love that we feel can be broadened uh, and deepened. Yeah. yeah. I, really, I really felt all those things too. And I, I, I'm another proud graduate of BYU. I think Aubrey, you're the only one that is I'm not. I'm an Aggie, you're Patrick. The, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Which means, of course, that you had the best education. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. I thought you just Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> um, 
but they pay no, my I, bills right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's fair. That's fair. Um, no, but I, I feel, I feel largely the same way. And I, I was really resonating with that portion of the talk to you. It seems just every time we drive down through Provo, we, I mean, it's a special, you know, it's a special place. BYU, it does have a unique, uh, it does have a unique, even just feel about it. Um, and I really, I really love a lot of, of uh, a lot of things about it. Um, it seemed, it seemed that when Elder Holland made the transition, you know, into the, the parts where that he referred to as, you know, the same sex challenge, he, um, he was uh, sort of, obviously he was focusing in on where it seemed like he felt, or maybe the brother and more broadly felt that BYU is in danger of diverging, you know, from its, uh, from its unique mission. Um, and obviously that's where a lot of people felt that uh, there were, there were some problems with, um, with what he said. There, like Aubrey alluded to, there was sort of a, you know, an immediate firestorm on, on social media and, and elsewhere due to his, uh, his comments. And mo- many of the takes that I, that I saw and read and heard and talked about with were from, you know, were from straight people, either, you know, allies or, or defenders of, of, the, of the speech and of El- Elder Holland generally. Um, Tom, I, I felt like I sort of magnifying voices that are actually directly in the LGBTQ community um, to talk about how the speech made made them feel uh, is really important, and so I, I I would love if you would take a moment to to share what you felt as you listened to that portion of the talk and what you've um, and and what you've seen, read, heard from yeah. from other friends in the in the community. You know, and I think as we start that, it's important to say that the the intended audience for Elder Holland's remarks here is essentially an audience of church employees. Yeah. Right. So. You know, we but the way it's publicized, it comes across almost like a devotional or general conference talk that yeah. is intended for a larger audience. And so, so you know, many of the of the feelings I had or that others had um, were really from a broader perspective, uh, and yet he's speaking in a narrower one. And I want to acknowledge that that um, you know that I'm I am perhaps taking some of his comments uh, to my heart in a way that he didn't intend, but. There, there were really four things, and I'll try to do this briefly, that, that I think struck uh, me and other uh, LGBTQ members of the church, and especially students at BYU. Um, the first is when he began by reading a letter from a concerned person who I gather is a parent of former students or something like that, uh, suggesting that they no longer want to send their children or their dollars to BYU, presumably if it is a welcoming place for LGBTQ students, staff, and faculty. And you know, many parents of LGBTQ students reached out to me and to others and said, boy, I feel the same way. I'm really worried about sending my kids there because I don't want to put them in a place that, that perhaps is going to be hostile to the reality of their lives or that will somehow discourage them from really discovering um, how, as children of heavenly parents, they can embrace all the identities that are meaningful in their lives. And that, that I think gets to the second point, which is that you know, what felt like sort of a scornful reference to Matt Easton's valedictory address two years ago, um, suggesting that he commandeered the ceremony to announce his sexual identity. Um, you know, that, obviously that's a pretty painful example of one with authority uh, calling out or, or demeaning one without the power differential, there's a challenge. But, but also, um, you know, I, th- I think uh, that one thing Elder Holland has always done so effectively, again, is to ensure that when he's speaking, he leaves room for people in all their individual circumstances to, um, to not feel he's um, demeaning them. Right, and, and um, you know, so this felt kind of contrary to that. But, but I was also struck by the fact that you know, any prior valedictorian at BYU who has mentioned his wife or her husband with appreciation has announced their sexual identity. Right? Good point. So Good point. <laughs> what's so different? You know, in this, um, so I, in some cases we're sort of saying, well, if you are in the majority, um, please say what you want. And if you're in the minority, your comments will be heard in a way that's divisive. Mm. And, and that, again, I absolutely don't believe he intends that, um, but that can be the feeling of it, that, that somehow if my experience is not shared by most people 
if I speak to my own experience, then somehow I'm introducing an element that others can see as divisive. Um, I also was struck by the, the whatever Matt's uh, current engagement may be with the church or not, I don't know, but it stands in comparison as he, as Matt talked about, uh, an appreciation for the experiences of BYU uh, that helped him in spiritual growth and in a healthy acceptance of his own, uh, the realities of his own circumstances of his uh, sexual identity. Um, stands in contrast to, and Aubrey, you mentioned this, what the term that Elder Holland used of same-sex challenge. Oh, the challenge, right? yeah. And, and we hear that <laughs> language that being gay or trans is a challenge or an affliction. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't believe it is. It's simply a reality. And that reality, I believe, is neither morally positive nor negative. Um, Elder Holland said that, um, you know, that, that any, he used the example of, of being gay is not a a release from commandments or an exemption from commandments. I agree, there is no exceptionalism in the gospel in that sense. But that gets to a critical point, which is I think what we want to do is use our efforts and our energy not to dispute someone's identity or suggest they hide it or only speak of it in these very limited circumstances, but to say that every single one of us has the opportunity to make the choice to follow Christ. That's the most important choice in our lives. And that's where I think we should be spending our energy to talk, not only to students at BYU, but everybody else we encounter, which is how is it that we are accepting that challenge, making that choice to, uh, to work to follow the Savior more diligently on a, on a daily basis. Um, I also think that, um, that when Elder Holland said that BYU's mission, you know, presumably with regard to the marriage doctrine, means foregoing some professional affiliations and certifications, then so be it. You know, that, that's not a gratuitous comment, and it's really likely that specific schools within BYU will lose national certification, absent any changes. And the feeling of his comment to LGBTQ listeners, I believe, certainly I felt it to an extent, uh, is that the educational scope of BYU can shrink. The membership roles of the church can contract. Convert baptisms in developed countries can continue to dwindle in order that no change to current teachings about marriage would happen. And you know, that's a, that I think was the most challenging message or sense of the remarks that uh, LGBTQ members of the church and those, their families, those who love them uh, might have come away from. Yeah, that was a really comprehensive answer. Thank you. Sorry. One, one, no, that was so great. I, one thing I wanted to ask you in particular about just reaction wise, I, um, it, one thing that I've seen floating around social media a lot was just this idea, especially from straight members of the church defending Elder Hall and saying he expressed so much love. He expressed so much love. Like it wasn't that bad. Like you could see how sincere he was and, you know, he wept and, and, and I, you know, that comforted me a little bit too. Like I, I, I appreciated that he seemed like this was hard to talk about, but I, I uh, had another, I talked to someone else who is LGBTQ and, and who felt really different about that exact point that it was actually, it was the tears and the expressions of love that actually were the most difficult to hear because it was such a mixed message. And, and so for him, it felt like it felt, um, I'm, I'm going to say what he said, which is abusive. It felt like it was something very harmful mixed up with a lot of love. And that to him felt, felt damaging. Like it felt that was the hardest part. So I don't, I don't know that that's how every, I mean, I mean, obviously that's not how everyone experiences that, but could you, have you, have you heard that sentiment expressed and could you talk about how maybe that's being received by other people in the LGBTQ community? Yes. I, and I think that relates to the fact that, um, you know, that so many have seen Elder Holland as this uh, just so conspicuously uh, caring and compassionate, empathetic person. And perhaps uh, because the remarks were delivered by him, it mm. came across in a, in a way that felt uh, even um, more painfully. And I, you know, again, I, I think we want to talk about the message, not the messenger, except for the fact of, you know, this is a person that we all admire who has just had such great impact on, on all of us, right? And, and his expressions of love are absolutely genuine. I don't think there was anything 
about that that was contrived or um, intended to, um, I don't know, soften a message in some fashion. Yeah. I, I think he was really genuine there about the wrestle. And that wrestle continues. I, I think the I think the challenge again is um, that we don't want to be loved only as we suffer, or only as we're afflicted. <laughs> you know, we want to be strong and healthy, and um, active disciples of Jesus Christ, who are um, healthy in our own understanding of ourselves and the reality of our lives, and and to be able to share love and receive love in a wholesome, uh, helpful way, um, not just uh, as an object of pity. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Um, sorry, Aubrey, were you going to say something? I was going to switch gears. I have a Patrick question, so if you have anything else. Oh, no, please go ahead, yeah. Okay, so I, um, this thing you mentioned, Patrick, about, you know, every church needs a place for the thinking to be done. I, that's such an interesting thought, and, I, and I, I can see that that is the case. And I, it reminded me of the article that Peggy Fletcher Stack um, wrote for the Tribune. And I think she quoted, I think she was actually quoting an, another alumnus. Yeah. Um, Michael Austin. And he said basically the same thing. He said, like, he said, you know, it's great for a church to have a think tank where everyone has PhDs and that's where the thinking can be done, but that isn't how universities work. You know, it can't be, BYU can't be the universe or the, the church's think tank. So could you talk about that and, and how, how do you know, how do you make both of those things work? Like, is it even possible to truly be intellectually honest if you are supported by a church that you're being asked to defend? Yeah, that's great. And, and, and I, I agree that I thought that Mike's uh, uh, quotes that he shared in, in Peggy's article were really useful. I'd recommend people to go back and, and revisit those. And, and it, part of it has to, to do with um, what, uh, what professors are hired to do. And, and what, um, what we do as researchers. Uh, research isn't really research if you already know the answer. Uh, and <laughs> um, that's called confirmation bias, right? right? Uh, and so the scientific method, and however it's applied, whether in the hard sciences or in the humanities you know, or in history like I'm in, right? But the idea is you have a question that you don't know the answer to, and you go out and gather data and you apply theory and you do a kind of rigorous ex examination, oftentimes the data conflicts with itself, right? Uh, it's rarely straightforward. And using the, the, the best tools that, that you have available and all of these different disciplines, whether it be chemical engineering or history or, or you know, marketing or whatever, we've all developed different disciplines uh, that, that we apply to this to try and kind of structure the knowledge, structure the kinds of questions and, and the, the process uh, that, that we go through to generate knowledge. Well, then, then, then we we follow where the data leads, right? And uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, we we usually go into it with a hunch or a hypothesis, and sometimes the data confirms that, and sometimes it surprises us. Uh, and and so then we we publish the findings, and the idea is is that that we publish findings that in and then any other researcher could come along, and could test our findings and contest our process and, and either come up with the same results or at least see how those results could be, you know, could be determined, right? Um, if, if you begin with the, the answer in mind, right, and, and, then, and then work backwards from there, that's not research in, in any recognizable way in the in the academy that's developed since the middle ages right <laughs> um you know these are long time tested uh methods that, that that we have uh to to create this kind of knowledge to to create expertise and so so i think from a, a faculty perspective that um you know i mean what what mike austin said he says you know that that becomes propaganda right if, if you're saying right. Here, here's what the party line is now go support it right now mm -hmm. now go find uh uh you know things to fit that preconceived narrative that's not what we do at universities that's not what we do at byu um you know in the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints we're in the truth business right we have an article of faith yes uh, that talks about that right and so we're not afraid of the truth 
Um, and so we will follow the truth and, and we can find lots and lots and lots of scriptures and quotes from church leaders that, that, uh, that, that speak to this. The kind of, that's one of the things I love about Mormon theology is the expansiveness of it, the, the willingness to encounter and incorporate scientific knowledge and philosophical knowledge and religious knowledge, even if it comes from other traditions, right? All of this, as Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and other leaders have taught, that's all Mormonism, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so we, um, that's, that's what should be going on at the Lord's University is the pursuit of truth. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes truth forces us, you know, sometimes our research forces us to rethink the way we think about the world. Um, but that's, that's a good thing, right? I mean, that, that's, right. that's why we have yeah. the modern world that, that we live in. Uh, and sometimes we get answers that don't make sense. And sometimes other researchers come up with other answers that are different, right? Within the fields, we have, we have competing things all the time. Um, that, that's fine. This is, so we work that out, but, but we don't start with, with the answer in mind, you know, academic research is not a game of jeopardy. You don't start with the answer, uh, <laughs> yeah. and then work backwards sure. to the questions. So, um, so, so we, you know, that there are tried and true methods that we need to follow, uh, even at BYU. So or especially Patrick, at BYU, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> could I, okay. Could I, could I challenge you on that just a little bit? Because I feel yeah. like, I feel like BYU in general, in many of the sort of scientific fields, we, I mean, we do a pretty good job with that. Um, sure. In the more quote unquote Mormon studies sorts of fields, I feel like, and this is even going back to a talk that Elder Holland gave at the Maxwell Institute, maybe it was a couple of years ago, I think. Um, it feels like there is more of a direct call to apologetics or beginning with the end in mind. Like I, I, I have a hard time, you know, seeing BYU publish uh, evidence, you know, evidence that doesn't, um, you know, say, or, or that doesn't bode well for, you know, Book of Mormon historicity or for uh, the characters of Joseph Smith or Brigham Young. You know, I, th I feel like, you know, maybe it's like, okay, we're, we can be a scientist, we can follow that tried and true academic method for, uh, you know, a large swath of things, but then there's this specific field of faith where, where maybe we do end up a little bit, or start with the, you know, with the end in mind a little bit, a little bit more. Um, there's a, Elder Holland quoted a, a letter that he received um, from a parent that sort of credited a BYU department, specific department and its faculty with, she said, the destruction of, of um, her friend's faith. And I'm just wondering, like, is it reasonable for a parent to expect, you know, a child or whoever to go to, to go to an academic institution and, and, and say that they're going to be challenged? Because that's what you think of when you think of the modern university is their, their thoughts and beliefs are going to be challenged. Is it, is it reasonable or, or appropriate, I guess, to say you're going to be challenged in all these ways, but you're going to be affirmed in this in this one way? Well, I don't think it's reasonable for any of us to send our kids to BYU in order to be insulated from the rest of the world and to its ideas, right? Then, then, then what's the point? Yeah. Right. Um, the the BYU is the place where we engage the world and its ideas, and we do so from the perspective and the foundation of the restored gospel. Right. That's very different than sticking your head in the sand and pretending like all these issues don't exist, pretending like the scientific research isn't out there, pretending like some people don't believe in the historicity of the Book of Mormon. And here's the reasons why. No, BYU should be precisely the place where we talk about that. Right. That should be precisely the place where in religious education classes, they say, you know what, there are a lot of people who do not believe in the history, historicity of the Book of Mormon, both from skeptical and even sometimes from faithful perspectives. Here's what the evidence suggests. Here's why I believe it, you know, uh, and, and here, let's make some arguments for historicity or, or whatever the issue does. You know, and the church has already done this with the gospel topics essays. You say, you know, I can't believe the Maxwell Institute publishing anything that would that would you know speak negatively or or with the problematic problematic aspects of the church's history. Well, the church did this itself, right? The church published essays that that, that come that, that speak very forthrightly about all kinds of difficult topics in, in church history. So actually, we we have a great model coming out of Salt Lake uh, in terms of that we're not afraid of the truth. We're not going to run from the facts. We're going to present them, and then we're going to talk about them. And then BYU is precisely the place where we should try to make sense of them. Um, and so, uh, 
you know, and, and, and this notion that the professors are running around radicalizing uh, their students, I think most professors would love to have that much influence, <laughs> right? <laughs> but but uh, the, the reality is kids come in, they take a few notes or pretend to while they're, you know, looking at TikTok <laughs> in class and then, and then they, they walk out, right? Um, look, who knows what's going on in any particular classroom or in any particular professor's office, right? And 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 certainly, I, I have no doubt that there there would be cases, you know, where where uh, where sometimes things like that have happened. But but if 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 you look at the the faculty and look at what's goes goes on there, I think you you see you know the vast majority of faculty who are very mission supportive. Yeah. It, it reminds me, I was talking to some of the professors' friends at BYU. <clears throat> who you know mentioned this letter that Zelda Holland read and said, you know, there is no one on the faculty of BYU who hasn't, whose file does not contain letters from parents who are upset by something their kid said that professor taught. It's that, you know, it's sometimes wow. it's that, you know, you're, you're too conservative, you're too liberal, whatever it might be, but uh, I don't know. And so, you know, I think every, every person just as we are there is doing their very best to, um, to follow where the spirit leads them. And I think that's the point of BYU is to have the very best scholarship we can find led by the spirit uh, as we seek uh, through as much uh, different information, different perspectives as we can to see where the spirit will lead us. Yeah, yeah. And, and so it makes sense that, that this idea becomes the most um, charged around LGBTQ issues, I think, because people are really trying to figure out, you know, if they, if they think that the church is going to ever move here and they're, they're recognizing um, the discomfort in either their own lives or the lives of people that they love. And so, and so I think there's this idea that you can go to this university and have these really healthy debates and kind of like feel this out for yourself. And, 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 and so I think for a lot of people, the speech felt kind of like a, it, it sort of felt like a warning to stop doing that. Like if he was, he talked so much about this, about unity and how, you know, next to reaching perfection, the next best thing would be being totally unified with the prophet. And, and he talks about, you know, a house divided can't stand. And it just was like this constant call to like be one and to trust and to, and to be unified with, with what the prophet is saying. And so maybe it gets, maybe that it gets kind of fuzzy because, you know, historical issues don't seem quite so angsty right now because it's over and, you know, we can have these interesting conversations about it, but, but LGBTQ issues are happening right now and are, are really affecting people's lives like in real time. And so, so I understand why people feel so like, like they really, like are, they're hanging on every word that he said and like trying to, I, I heard uh, I have one good friend who was really like trying to analyze, like, am I, am, what am I, am, am, is what I'm doing like considered condoning? Like, is there any way that I can like switch the words in my mind to make this feel like I'm not technically condoning or advocating? And, and I, I like empathize with the pain that she was feeling because she wants to be unified with the prophet the way, the way Elder Holland was, was challenging everyone to be. And at the same time, like she is really recognizing that, that she's not sure she is. She's not sure she is in alignment. So can you, can you talk about this idea that, that and I don't know who wants to answer this, but the difference between healthy disagreement that creates progress and like continues the restoration forward versus a divided house that is falling apart. Well, that sounds like a good Patrick question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, well, I'll start and then you can, uh, you can clean up, uh, uh, Tom. But um, no, I think it's a terrific question. I think it's a, it's a question we have to grapple with. I think so much of it has to do with the um, with the intent uh, mm. behind it, with what is in somebody's heart, uh, and to to what end, right? Um, look, I mean, disagreements are natural. Conflict is a natural part of life, right? Uh, when uh, conflict is built into creation. Uh, conflict is built into relationships, right? Conflict itself is 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 neutral, and and, and in fact can be um, can be put to positive and, and constructive use. Um, the the issue and and what the Lord warns us against and what is destructive to relationships and to societies and to the kingdom of God is is what Christ calls contention in Third Nephi eleven, and that's where we approach 
conflict with anger and with recrimination and with cynicism and with an intent to harm, uh, an intent to tear down. And that's what Christ warns us against and says is of the devil uh, in, in his language. That's very different than simply disagreeing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, and, and so we, for, for whatever reason, as, as a culture and as a people, especially in the United States, I don't know so much globally, but we've developed this sort of Mormon nice thing, right? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of passive aggressive part of it, right? A lot of it is, is real kindness, right? And, and, and I think people from the outside who encounter it, you know, uh, or who are so struck by it, that they, they don't understand that actually it is rooted in fundamental kindness and decency and compassion, but it can be passive aggressive. It can also be, uh, we are experts at conflict avoidance, mm. right? Uh, as a people, we are generally very poor at engaging conflict in healthy, constructive ways. It's one of the things we have to, to grow in as, as a people and individually. And and so I think this, this is one of these areas where, where we have to, because here's the thing, and I'll just say one more thing and then, and then toss it over to, to Tom. I mean, the, the, the conflict in the church right now is real and present and unsustainable around this issue. We have our own sort of Zion Canyon right now, where on the one side, we have the prophets and apostles teaching doctrine, which is their prerogative, and we sustain them as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint in their calling to do so. Part of that doctrine that they declare is the doctrine of love and the doctrine of compassion, but it's also doctrines around sexuality and around marriage. On the other side of the canyon, we have the real experiences of our LGBTQ sisters and brothers who are, as Tom said, they're not only in pain, but there is a lot of pain. And looking across the canyon, it's, it's hard to know how we would ever bridge that. And, and in, in, in the middle of that canyon is just a ton of pain and yeah. confusion and hurt. And it's felt on both sides, right? And, and there are some people just lobbing artillery shells back and forth, right? But there are a lot of people who want to build bridges, who want to find a way to, to bridge that gap and aren't sure how, right? And, and I'm convinced that that's where the work of Jesus happens, mm. right? I'm, I'm convinced that as Latter-day Saints right now, our calling is to somehow find a way to build a bridge over Zion Canyon, right? And, and to find a way to, to, to bridge these things. I mean, I, the, the, the scripture that I always come back to is in Ephesians chapter two, uh, where it says, now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace in his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. Uh, and so he came and proclaimed peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. And so that's, that's the work of Jesus. And then that's our work, right? There's so many people who feel far off, who feel near. It, it looks like an unbridgeable divide. It looks like there's all this hostility. It's, there's all these dividing walls. And right now where we're at is unsustainable right? For exactly for, for your, your friends, you know, her sentiment, right? I think a lot of us feel this, right? How can we sustain the prophets and apostles and how can we love our sisters and brothers, right? It seems impossible. That's the challenge that we have before us, right? I don't think we have the answers yet. I think we have to, we're, we're looking for conversations like this, the conversations there, right? The prayers that have been said over the past two weeks, the prayers that Elder Holland said that he and his, you know, brethren in the leadership offer, you know, daily. That's how we're going to get there because the Lord's going to give us more revelation. We're not there yet. Where we're at right now, we, 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 we can't stay here. Yeah. Because uh, because the gap is too big. So our our job together is is to fill that canyon. I hope we fill it with compassion and love and discipleship and trust. Uh, and all those, those, those kinds of things, but it's, it's going to take a little patience as, as we seek the Lord's revelation. I think that's <clears throat> profound. I, um, you know, I think what we always have to be focused on is the savior, the reality of Jesus Christ and, the, uh, his salvific mission from assigned by our heavenly parents for our, for our good, for our behalf. And that that's the, that is the framework of everything we're trying to understand. 
you know, as you're talking about it, Patrick, I'm thinking about the ninth article of faith, right? That yep. the promise that God will reveal more. And I, you know, I, I think the, you know, that we all have a role in that, right? The obviously prophets in formulating the questions and, and the, the heavy lifting of pondering and searching and trying to solicit uh, viewpoints. Um, but also I think each of us in that uh, we don't tell the Lord what it is he needs to reveal. You know, we, we pray that our lives are such that he will feel to reveal more, that we're doing our very best to live what we have and desire a, a larger picture, a better understanding of the scope, um, and that, uh, that our hearts and minds will be prepared for whatever he chooses to reveal, whenever that might be. And in that, you know, in that process, I think, again, we, we each may um, see things from the perspective we have, the experiences we've had and have ideas about how uh, progress could be made. But I think we want to not be so wed to our own points of view that we're not ready uh, to hear something that the Lord will say that with his obviously much larger uh, perspective and, and understanding. I also think that we can look at our history um, and say, okay, where, how have we understood conflicting views in the past uh, and how has the Lord enlightened in those circumstances? And I was, I was reading a, a chapter of a book uh, by um, uh, Matthew Harris called uh, the LDS Gospel Topic Series of Scholarly Engagement. And he's talking about um, some teachings around uh, what might be called a doctrine of whiteness. Mm. Um, but, he, you know, he, he talks about the fact that uh, from Brigham Young to Spencer Kimball, um, many apostles or prophets and prophets have uh, you know, in private letters or conversations or even in published pieces uh, shared their personal view that um, in the next life, everyone would be white. And, you know, we certainly wouldn't believe that or teach that today, but that was, you know, for a hundred years, uh, a view at least of many. I'm not saying that was the majority, it certainly wasn't all, but, but some very influential voices, Joseph Fielding, Smith, Bruce McConkie, others. Um, and, you know, I'd say that um, as a single gay man, uh, others have lovingly said to me that um, in the next life, I will be straight. And, you know, I, I think we have heavenly parents who delight in variety. And I think that variety <laughs> is beautiful. <laughs> so, you know, I, I feel the love in what somebody says that they have found happiness as a, as a married person whose gender is clear. There's no conflict between the gender they feel in their spirit versus what's evident in their body. Um, but I'm not sure that that... Um, exact way of being happy will be the way everyone will be happy. And perhaps we could allow that uh, variety and diversity um, uh, in a common framework of desiring to follow Christ and to each day become more diligent and effective as his disciples uh, isn't suddenly going to make us um, exact duplicates of everyone else. Uh, that, that in fact, uh, the variety of our experiences of, of perhaps our intelligences uh, actually allows us to reach um, uh, others in ways that it's, some of whose experiences is different might not. So I feel like the Lord can use us in all of our variety uh, to be useful tools for him. And perhaps that will continue into the next life. That's yeah, beautiful. I mean, yeah, exactly, Tom. I mean, God doesn't want clones, but he doesn't want ites either, <laughs> right? And, and, and that's say. that's that's what the church is supposed to do, and that's what we're supposed to figure out, is right. How how do we find unity and diversity uh, uh, while at the same time not turning our diversity into identities that overshadow our unity, yeah. right, uh, as, as children of God? And that's, that's, that's a real tension. Yeah. That, that seemed like something he is, Elder Holland specifically was, um, was, is worried about. He, 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 let me see if I can find the, what he actually said about, whoops, about flags. I mean, he, he seemed just concerned 
that there are symbols that are more divisive than unifying. And, and I guess he didn't, he didn't specifically say pride flags or pride parades, but he said flags and parades and other and symbols and language that is divisive. Maybe Tom, could you just, could you talk about how you see these symbols? Like, does it feel divisive? Like, are you, do you recognize it as, as a big platform that is meant to set someone apart or just how do, how do you feel when you see a pride flag at BYU or anywhere? Proud. <laughs> I, you know, and, and it struck me when uh, when Matt Easton gave his speech and called himself a gay son of heavenly parents. You know, the the response of his peers in that uh, in the in the Marriott Center was thunderous, right? I mean, so I don't think that needs to be divisive. I think I think as we love each other, we desire that each person will fill the measure of their creation, right? We'll find all the attributes and capabilities and talents and gifts that they've been given and uh, find joy in those and find joy in sharing those. Uh, put those at the service of the Lord uh, in a desire to lift those around us. So I don't, I don't feel like a pride flag or a parade is meant to be exclusive. I think it's meant to be celebratory. That, um, that, that we're, that's why there's an audience at a parade, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that we celebrate with those who are marching and, uh, in the joy of, of recognizing talents and gifts and experiences that can bring joy and diversity and variety and beauty to the world. Um, and the experience, you know, sir, I would, let me just personalize it a minute to say, you know, in my own experience, I have felt like that being gay was a reason for me to seek even more diligently to draw closer to the savior. I felt like I needed to know that he knew me. And um, uh, you know, his awareness of me, his uh, understanding of my experiences. And you know, each of us, I hope, have that experience uh, because of the different experiences in each life, right? I mean, in, for me, it was being gay that led me to it or gave me greater impetus to, to push harder in that sense. Um, others will have their own. I think, you know, again, there's so many different uh, ways that we each experience the world, but each of those experiences can be used in the service of the Lord. And I don't think we need to be afraid of the fact that uh, that we each have experienced his love the, through the, the lens of the lives that we live. Yeah. Can, can, I, can I talk about, that's so great, Tom. Can I, can I just share a, a quick story about these uh, symbols and especially about flags? So, and I, I think it gets at the heart of, of kind of the tension here. So, so we, we moved to Logan a couple of years ago and We'd only been here for a couple of weeks when we went on family vacation. Uh, and when we came back, uh, we, we came back and, and drove, you know, and uh, pulled into our driveway and saw that there was a big pride flag flying in our front yard. And I was like, I don't remember putting it there. <laughs> and, and, and my wife said, oh, yeah, I think I signed up for uh I don't, I'm going to out myself, you know, for the Cash Valley Democrats, right? And, <laughs> and I think it's Pride Week, and I think they were going around and, and putting flags in people's yards, right? You know, if you gave a donation or something like that, right? And so I was like, oh, okay. And so we got home and unloaded, and, and, you know, we were thinking about it. I was like, okay, what does this mean? We just moved into this neighborhood in northern Utah. We just moved from Southern California, right? Nobody knows us. And now all of a sudden, we've got a Pride flag in, in our yard. Like, what 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 are people going to see in that right and now my wife has a, a gay brother and uh who's who's engaged and and that um he it, it's it's been a big part of our family life and and to see him happy as he uh sort of embraces his identity and and finds finds a partner and and so that's and so on the one hand, so so my wife was like, you know, we, we want to fly that flag to support my brother, right? And but we also had this tension, like, what will the neighbors think, right? <laughs> you know, that we were gonna come in and you know spread our California values or whatever and you know, in, in peaceful Logan. So we we decided, like, well, let's let's not make any waves, let's take the flag down. So we took the flag down that night. And then 24 hours, we didn't feel good about it. So we put the flag back, back up, right? <laughs> and so our and so later that week, like our neighbors who were just getting to know us, like a couple of them, they were like, 
we saw the flag come, come down and then we saw it go back up and we didn't know like what's going on. Right. And, <laughs> and they were confused and we were confused. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and it's, it's because, yeah, the, the same symbol can mean totally different things to different people. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so insofar as it was flying in our yard for us, it was an act of love and solidarity for Melissa's brother and for all of our gay friends, you know, uh, and, and, and family members, other people could see that as, as a kind of threat, right? As a kind of divisive thing and, and so forth. So that's that's the tough things about symbol. I mean, we, we also, we sort of wanted to put a plaque out in front next to the flag, like this is why we are flying the flag, right? But right. But, but this that, that's not that's not what, you, you don't get to do that with symbols. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's, that's the, and I think it's generational largely, you know, pride flags yeah. and rainbows and all those kinds of things. What oftentimes older Americans see as divisive, uh, younger, like millennials and Gen Z, they see those exact same symbols as like the most inclusive right. uh, symbols uh, that are out there, uh, the opposite of division. So sy symbols are tough. Maybe you could get an angel Moroni to be on top of the flagpole. <laughs> <laughs> out, out of his trumpet, because it could be coming out a rainbow or something like that. We need to. Uh, <laughs> no, but I, and I hear you. That's really, it's a great point of, um, you know, something that feels really unifying and supportive and, and uh, inclusive to me uh, can indeed feel divisive to somebody else. And it's, it's I, I think it's what you said before, the, the need for us. Um, as we strive to feel the love of the Savior in our hearts and to convey it, to transmit it to others around us, to um, to part of that, I think, is listening and really trying to absorb the goodness of the people around us and, and not judge by symbols, but to take the opportunity to know their hearts. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, um, I think it's important to, thank you both so much for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, I think it's important to talk about one of the portions of the talk that maybe raised the most eyebrows, which was um, when Elder Holland uh, specifically called for disciples and defenders of the faith, he, I think the words he used to have a trowel in one hand and a, and a musket in the other. And he called for specifically in, in his words, um, more musket fire from this institution in regards to defending, uh, defending the faith. And I want to be very clear and disabuse anyone of the notion that we think that Elder Holland was actually calling for violence of any kind. It was very clear in the talk that he was speaking metaphorically. Um, he uh, and I, I think, uh, and it was it was clear that what what he really wanted was for uh, academics and those at the institution to use their to use their skills to um, to defend the church and to uphold the the institution that's you know that's upholding the institution of BYU and 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 those that work at it. Um, that being said, obviously, I, I, a lot of people saw some problems with um, with that language. And Patrick, in particular, I know that you've done a lot of work and and research as sort of a, a proponent of nonviolence. Um, and I'm I'm curious. I mean, really, for both of you, how you uh, how you took that, and w in general, what what rhetoric what, what rhetoric like that can mean in a community and, and uh, just your thoughts on it. Yeah, so, so that was a really hard part of the, the talk for me to hear. Um, and, and as I you know, talked with people or been on social media, I've seen that, that for a lot of um, our LGBTQ sisters and brothers that um, that was extremely hard because this is a community uh, and many individuals within it who have been victims of very real violence. Uh, certainly rhetorical violence, uh, which continues, I think about the things I said, um, you know, all, all the way up through when I was at BYU, uh, joking with my friends and, and the kind of rhetorical violence we used uh, and homophobic slurs and so forth. And I'm um, deeply ashamed of that. And, and a lot of that rhetorical violence still happens. Uh, but there's actual violence. <laughs> there, there are gay and lesbian and transgender and bisexual children and adults who are victimized by real violence in this country and especially around the world every single day. So to use the language of violence, even if it's metaphoric, uh, in connection um, 
uh, with the, the this message about the LGBTQ community. I think it was, um, I, I completely agree with you, Tim. I mean, I'm sure Elder Holland would be, ab he'd be the first to be horrified if anybody used his language to justify any kind of violence uh, against any of our brothers and sisters. But I think it was inartful at, 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 the, at the very least. Um, and, and this is the thing, I mean, the, the language we use matters. And it's certainly true that scripture and the teachings of prophets, our hymn books, they are full of violent imagery, right? And it's not just Old Testament stuff, right? I mean, the book of Revelation, right? The New Testament has this, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord speaks, you know, in, in some pretty strong and, and sometimes harsh language, right? So this, so, 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 so we, we have this kind of language. We sing onward Christian soldiers, right? You know, the, the, these kinds of things. And, and we know that most of that is metaphorical, but we also know that it's contributed to real violence throughout history. And, and it seems to me that we, each of us individually, and then also as a community, we have a choice to make. You know, what, one of, in his last sermon to the Israelites, um, the, 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 the Lord through Moses said, I set before you life and death, therefore choose life that you may live. And I think we have this in the language of scripture, in the language of our hymns, in the language of, of our church leaders. We have peaceful language and we have violent language. I set before you life and death, choose life. I think we can choose language that is full of life. We can choose language that is nonviolent. It doesn't mean you have to be wimpy about stuff, right? Uh, you can speak very strongly. You can speak very firmly, but without using the metaphors of violence. And it's hard to do. We use it all the time, right? We say mm -hmm. the Yankees annihilated the Red Sox, you know, last night or something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just part of our, our everyday discourse. But but I, I think we need to be thoughtful and intentional about it as disciples of the Prince of Peace. Will the words coming out of our mouth point people towards peace and towards love and towards care and compassion? Um, so, so maybe, maybe this is, a, is an episode where maybe all of us think a little harder about the language we use in our everyday life, and especially when we're teaching gospel principles. So I, I, I can imagine someone pushing back a little bit about this idea that Jesus is only the Prince of Peace. You know, like we, we have scripture that you could read, you know, maybe just as convincingly that that would justify this idea of a warrior God, you know, like a fighting, oh, yeah. angry warrior God. And so, so how do you reconcile both of those? And, and why do we get to choose to be, choose the peaceful God? So it's, it's a great question, Aubrey. And so this is, um, uh, so I'm, I'm going to plug my, my uh, book that's oh, coming out next yes! month, uh, <laughs> uh, which is called Proclaim Peace, the Restoration's Answer yeah. to a, an Age of Conflict. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we're actually we have, we have a whole chapter about this question of, of oh, God's yeah. violence, right? And uh, I'll I'll give you a, the the very brief <laughs> answer here is that yes, absolutely. I I I I don't believe that that we can just pick and choose and just pick the Jesus we like, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we have, we have the whole scriptural record. We have to wrestle with the whole scriptural record, okay? But on this score. I would argue, and you, you're going to have to read the book, uh, <laughs> available in all fine bookstores. Um, but, uh, but, but, uh, I, but, but I would argue that whatever language or instances we have of divine violence uh, is reserved to God Himself for a variety of reasons, and does not give license to His children to do that kind of violence to one another. Uh, and so, uh, so this is where, you know, uh, and, and I usually don't like it when we fall back on my thoughts are not your thoughts and, and, and so forth, right? But there is a way in which actually God is in a different state of being or than, than, than we are, right? To, be, to begin with, uh, he gives us the gift of resurrection, which is something that I cannot give anybody, Right. Uh, so this is this is the reason why violence is such a horrific sin because we cannot undo it, right? We do not have the power to undo it, uh, and so uh, 
as and, and God also just has a completely different calculation in terms of the way that, that that he interacts with with his children. So I would make the argument that yeah, we have to grapple with the the whole revelation of God that we have in scripture, but but even so that does not I would make the, the strong case that at no point does that give us license to treat each other violently and I would extend that to to the kind of rhetoric that we use. I mean Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Uh, not even to be angry with one another, right. to call one another fool, right? Um, and so he's clearly pointing to a kind of higher, holier way, not only of behavior, but of language uh, that, that, that we use when, when talking about one another. Wow, that's such a good answer, yeah. Can I jump on that too? I, yeah, I please, think Tom. It relates a bit also to Elder Holland's uh, comment again about condoning, um, because I think the, you know, we're, if we look at the, the life of Christ in the New Testament, you know, what we, we see his endless patience with those who are outside, right? The, the demeaned, the, the suffering, the afflicted, whatever. Um, but his, uh, if we hear sharp words or if we uh, hear him expecting more, it's of those who have authority over others, you know, whose responsibility it is to care for others. Mm -hmm. And his comments to them, as I read at least, are about their failure to, to frankly act in his name to benefit those they are responsible to serve. And I think that, I think there's a commonality of that uh, in, the, in the image of violence or the, the thinking about that and condoning, uh, which is really, it's stewardship, right? If we have stewardship given to us by the Lord over family, over uh, a calling for a season, whatever it might be, then I think uh, you know, section 121 comes into play, the reproving be times with sharpness, but afterwards showing forth an increase of love. So I don't think we can engage with the world for whom we do not have stewardship with sharpness uh, because it's not, it's not available to us to afterwards show forth an increase of love. Um, I think the, and I think to my mind, that kind of gets the notion, my notion of condoning how I avoid it is by how I live my life according to all the light I've received, not by how eloquently I tell someone else to live their life. Ooh. And so I, I just feel like the you know, this all comes together in that notion of um, you know how we um, the muskets are so easily aimed at the the uh, meek of the world, and um, that would certainly not be the Savior's desire for us. But I think we can. Um, share through our um, our lives, the light we have received, why we have a perspective that we may have. And that to me is how we put forward our uh, understanding and faith in and hope in Jesus Christ. I love that, yeah. What, what would you say, I, I've heard people um, criticize faculty at BYU who choose to stay. Because this, you know, there's this line that's been drawn that's crystal clear now, and and so the criticism is, you know, if you if you know this and you choose to stay, then you're 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 anti LGBTQ. So, do you think this is true? First of all, and and why else might faculty and staff and administration choose to stay at BYU after after a speech like this? Because if they're they can not serve it. Yeah. Okay. Thank. Yeah. Like, if they are affirming, like, is there any reason to stay? Because they can serve. Yeah, and I, and it's not that you're um, in there subtly undermining the brethren or teachings. It's uh, a desire to lift and see every individual, and and help them in whatever way you can in their individual circumstances. Uh, um, and I I really dislike that notion of we've the line is clear. You're either with us or you're against us. Um, I think the point is, you know, as, as those who would be disciples of Jesus Christ, we want to be with everyone and, uh, and to bring peace and his love to everyone. And we want, again, to listen and learn from the experiences of everyone around us. And it reminds me of that hokey old song, like, uh, was it? He drew a circle that left me out, and I drew a circle that brought him in, or whatever. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in a, in a sense, yeah. I think that's what we're saying is, yeah, you may say there's a dividing line, and I'm either in or out. But that, but my desire as someone who wants to follow Christ is there is no dividing line. Uh, we are we are all children of heavenly parents, 
we're all susceptible of receiving their influence and love and turning to them for healing. I love that. So, I, I mean, I think this is the real heart of the problem. Like, I don't think it would have, I don't think that people would, would be talking about it still if, if the question, if this question was clearer and that, and that is just, it feels like sort of a dichot, a dichotomy is surfaced and either you are affirming an apostate or you're, or you're not affirming and you're faithful and, and it, people are so uncomfortable because they do, they're feeling like they have to choose a side. So I love this idea that like, or you can draw a bigger circle and, you know, choose where you fit. Cause I, I think that's what, I think people feel like tortured by that idea that, that they just realized they were on the wrong side and they didn't mean to be of whatever, you know, whatever side they're on. So I think that's hope. That's hope. Given. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that um, we, we, we don't, uh, you know, these, these, these kinds of either or choices are usually false dichotomies. Yeah. Right. And um, again, it, it, it goes back to our usually unhealthy and uncreative ways that we engage conflict. Uh, we see it as two dimensional. We see it uh, as either or. And so then that leads us to either or solutions. Uh, life is usually much more complex than that. Relationships are more complex than that. Certainly being a disciple uh, and being a member of the church is more complex than that. And, and so we seek for both and solutions. And I'm pretty sure uh, that our heavenly parents love the prophets and apostles and their gay <laughs> daughters and sons, right? I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, and their so, gay non-binary children. Exactly, right? <laughs> And so, <laughs> um, so we can't, that, that's our challenge, right? And we haven't figured it all out, especially in terms of policies and, and you know, and, and, and doctrines and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, but when we, yeah, when we, when we set these things up as, as either or, um, we may be limiting the kind of creativity that, that, uh, that God often gives us in Revelation. Yeah. You know, that really makes me think of a phrase we sometimes hear, which is what has never, what has not changed and what will never change is mm -hmm. dot, dot, dot. And that's yeah. been applied to this topic in the past. And, you know, I feel like as, as beneficiaries of the prophet, Joseph Smith, Joseph, the revelator, uh, the only time we should ever use that sentence is when we're referring to the reality of Jesus Christ that has not changed and will not change. But everything else is subject to greater understanding, broader uh, knowledge uh, and light from heaven. And so I just, I think we just got to stop. Yeah. We don't divide either ors and we stop saying, telling the Lord what he can't tell us. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Or, or what he must tell us, right? right. I mean, all exactly. Of this, all of us exactly. want revelation to confirm what we already think, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and you mentioned it earlier, Tom, that, that sometimes we, we have to be open to, to being wrong. Right. Yeah, we, have to, that, we have to be open to revelation telling us the hard thing that that, that, that we don't like. Right? right. And so, I mean, one, and I don't know how you feel about this, Tom, but I but I never want to give people the kind of false hope that we're living in 1977. Right. That six months or a year from now, there's going to be we're going to get an announcement from the president of the church that where we do a 180 on this thing. Right. Right. Um, cause I, for me, I have no idea what the future holds, right? I, I absolutely believe that God has more, many great and important things to reveal to us. And this seems pretty great and important. So, right. so, so I have full expectation we'll receive more light and knowledge on the subject, but I don't know what that means. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what the timetable is. Right. And so I never want to give people the, the, the sense when, when I say that, I don't want to be, God's going to tell us what you think should happen and he's right. going to do it tomorrow. You know, I think well, that's, me... it's critical. We live in the developed world, right? So perhaps that's the perspective we operate from. So that I do, my sense is this is a critical issue for the growth of the church. Mm. Now I can be wrong, but I, but in that sense, I, that's, I think why uh, the Lord may yet reveal many great and important things that include this because it can provide opportunities for the, the expansion uh, the gathering to take place on a much broader scale than it seems to be constricted in right now. And the other thing I think is, you know, that when we talk about steadying the ark, I don't think we need to be so dogmatic or so afraid uh, that uh, the, the Lord's teachings will not stand, that we need to steady them, right? Mm -hmm. We, I think we, as our hope in Christ 
tells us we know the end of all things, that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ. So knowing that, I think we can say, okay, what's the, what is the way that I can live in this world today and love people whose perspectives and experiences are so different in a way that helps them to feel a desire to draw closer to the Savior? Yeah. yeah, I really, I, I really love what you're both are saying, and it really resonates with me. But I think there's a, I think there's a stance too that says, uh, you know, we have, we have more doctrine than just, uh, you know, Jesus is the Christ, and, um, and there, and doctrine doesn't change, you know, and like you'd say, okay, so what's doctrine? You know, maybe a standard definition is, it's what the sort of the uh, first presidency and the quorum of the twelve have, have taught consistently over time, you know, and. And I think what one place where we can hold up an example of this, or not we, but, you know, again, sort of like bringing in the argument from the more conservative side is to hold up the proclamation on the family and say, well, look, like we've got doctrine on, uh, uh, on what marriage really means. And therefore, that is, that is not going to change. And so all you people that think that, you know, that there's further light and knowledge on this, like, sorry, on this one, we're, we're a little set in stone. Do you have, do you have thoughts on because I like, and I think there are people, okay, let me, to be clear, I think there are people that are proponents of that idea. And, but then I think there are people that don't want to necessarily be proponents of that idea, but they don't see a real way around it either. Do you have, do you have thoughts on that? Wish, okay. And you throw, you saved the hand grenade to the end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, my feeling about it is we are the church of Jesus Christ, not the church of the family. Okay. So the centrality of our doctrine is Christ. Um, and we, you know, we believe that as we are part of the family of heaven, right? I think the nuclear family is a little hazier for me in terms of where that fits in doctrine, but it, there's no uncertainty about the family of heaven. Um, and I, so I think that's what I wanted to, to yeah. base my uh, foundation on uh, is that I think, um, you know, when we talk about the doctrine of Christ, it's repentance, ordinances, and endure to the end. Um, so I don't know, that's, I yeah. think that's a doctrine I, I want to focus on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it doesn't take a PhD in history to know that we've not always consistently taught that marriage between a man and a woman <laughs> is the only <laughs> marriage ordained of God, right? Uh, so um, so I, I, I think uh, we, we know that the shape of the family and teachings of the prophets and apostles about how that family structure relates to exaltation, uh, those teachings have changed uh, pretty substantially, even within the short history of, of the church. Uh, now, some people would say, okay, fine, there we're talking about numbers, we're not talking about, you know, genders and sexuality, right? Uh, okay, but, but uh, uh, it, but, but all that to say that anybody who would say that the doctrine of the family has been a constant throughout the restoration, um, not exactly, right? Uh, and uh, and, and, and I, th I think Tom's point is exactly spot on, that the whole notion of sealing is for the entire family of God to be sealed to one another and sealed to our heavenly parents. That is the family that our mother and father most want to reclaim and to restore. Uh, our nuclear families, whatever that looks like in the next life, right? Uh, and again, doesn't take very long to figure out. It gets real complicated. Like whose house does everybody live in, right? Yes. <laughs> you know, um, you know, uh, and so, but ceiling is about the entire family of God. Yeah, I love that idea. <clears throat> you know, during the time that I have, uh, again, been a member of the church, We've had the November 2015 policy uh, around um, apostasy of gay marriage and, and um, delaying of ordinances for children of those unions. Um, the reversal of that policy, some really challenging messages in general conferences. Um, but this one hit me. And I would say, you know, it's really taken two weeks to feel like I have my legs under me again. <clears throat> on this one, and partially because I love Elder Holland so much. Um, 
but also because it just felt like uh, doubling down again and again and again of um, a message that uh, it feels to me, uh, I'll use the word divisive since he used it in a different context. Um, and um, I, <clears throat> so in a lot of tears and prayers, the I can come back to what Patrick began with, which is that our hope is in Christ. That as I um, can orient my focus on him, then things I can't resolve, I can at least live with um, as I try to move forward and, and draw closer to him. I've also had conversations with some LGBTQ siblings who feel unseen. And I said, you know, I, I look at that verse in section 49, verse 8, where the Lord tells Joseph that he's reserved to himself holy men ye know not of. And I said, you know, if we're if we are trying to follow Christ, if we're uh, doing the very best we can to follow the Spirit each day and and to uh, turn to Him for healing, uh, to each day strive a little harder to to follow Him more diligently, perhaps we are holy men and women that others know not of. Um, and maybe that's not a consolation, but just like our faith is in Christ, I think our consolation is in Christ. And uh, if we are doing the very best we can and being willing to interrogate our souls as honestly as we can about our um, motivations, uh, but, but really trying to act uh, in love for heavenly parents and savior and for all around us, that's the best we can do whatever that looks like. And my, my best doesn't look like your best and, you know, any of the rest of us, right? It's in our unique spheres. Um, we are the only ones with the Lord who can determine what's best. Yeah. The, you so you know, the, 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 the one thing that I, um, I just have no patience for is if anybody takes any joy or pleasure, even secretly, in seeing some people leave the church um, and doing so in a sense of, oh, here we are separating the wheat from the tares. Mm -hmm. And isn't it nice that I'm wheat and they're tares? Um, go back to the parable. <laughs> Jesus does not give us the right to judge the wheat from the tares. So we, we, we use that parable in exactly the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Parable is all about, you can't tell who the wheat wow. and the tares are. You cannot tell. The only one who can tell is God at the end of time. And then he'll do his work. He'll figure it out, all right? You have no right because you can't tell. And... Um, so anybody who feels self-righteous or anything at any of this, right? I mean, we should be at anybody who leaves or anybody who feels like they can't worship among us, that there isn't space among us. We should just be in grief. We should be in mourning, right? And, um, and remember what Paul says about the body of Christ, which we're supposed to be that first of all, it includes all of the diversity of all of its members, just like Tom said, our heavenly parents delight in the diversity that they have made. But then Paul goes on to say that we give honor to the members that are least honorable. Not, not that they really are least honorable, but the, but the members that have been given the least honor by the rest of us. Those are the members of the body that we should welcome in and embrace and say and 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 pay attention to their gifts that we need in the rest of the body. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Both. Thank you so, so much. much. That was just amazing. Yeah. Every single point. Thank you. Thanks for being willing to be kind of vulnerable and and talk about something that is just hard. It's hard to do it perfectly, and we really appreciate all of the work you're doing. Yeah. This. I'll just Thanks. say, Good I'll just add, yeah, we, we love you, Tom. We love you, Patrick. You longtime friends and advisors to us. And we just can't, we just can't thank you enough. Absolutely. Thank you for giving us the chance to process this with you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much for listening. We hope that you enjoyed this episode and that it was helpful in some way. We want to extend a special thanks to Tom and Patrick for coming on and for being so open with us. 
And as always, if Faith Matters content is resonating with you and you get the chance, we would love for you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on. We read every review and it really helps us to get the word out about Faith Matters and we so appreciate the support. Thanks again for listening. As always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.